This week on Doctor Who, Amy finds herself stuck in the TARDIS. So I join Confidential and hope to take us out of this world at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Life on, on other planets could quite possibly exist. But well, we think it's quite likely because there are so many planets out there. But it might not be life as we know it. <laughs> Excellent. I actually can't believe that's real. That's real. And you can see the lines of the constellation and now the great bear himself. Oh. The doctor adopts the human touch. Deals with tricky situations upstairs and downstairs. Oh. 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 Watches as everyone gets a bit loopy over the time. Oh. And proves a bit of a star on the football pitch. And it's Craig Owens passing to the doctor. Oh, nice footwork. Impressive start from the gangling Gallifreyan. He's still going. Look at this. Oh, what a goal by the doctor. The King's Arms meet the rising sun in the battle of the pub teams. That's coming up later in the show. Best days filming ever on Doctor Who today. <laughs> Not because of JC, but because um, we're playing football. It's me. So, following this week's episode, the Doctor was dealing with a time loop and Amy was stuck in the TARDIS in space. So here I am at the home of time and space at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich to find out all about time and space and do time loops even exist? And I'm meeting Dr Maggie Adairan Pocock, uh, who's a space scientist, um, to find out what the time is. Oh. Ah. So, uh, Maggie, tell us why we're here today. Well, as you said, um, Greenwich is the home of time and space. The space comes from, this is an active uh, ast astronomical site. We have an active telescope here, which is educating the public. And the Astronomer Royal for the UK used to actually live here. So oh. space and astronomy plays a vital role here. Yeah. But time is critical here as well. Every new day here on planet Earth starts here at the Prime Meridian. And what exactly is this meridian line? Actually, what well, I can do better than that. I can actually show you the Prime Meridian. So step this way. <laughs> This is the meridian. No, no, this is the prime meridian. The prime meridian, I'm very sorry. But meridians are lines, that are imaginary lines, that run from the North Pole to the South Pole. And we use them to actually gauge time. So the prime meridian um, is uh, this line here. And this is actually the zero, the baseline, that we do all other measurements from. How we're standing at the moment, you're in, I think, the uh, Western Hemisphere, and I'm in the Eastern Hemisphere. So we're having a conversation over hemispheres. hemispheres. Yes. OK. And so, so the, the, this prime meridian line divides east from west. So what happens if I do this? Ah, now you are in both hemispheres at once. Look at me, I'm on two hemispheres. <laughs> I'm like dancing over hemispheres. <laughs> dancing across the hemispheres. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, so, essentially, this is the line where time begins. It is. This is where time oh. begins. Every new day starts along this line. It thinks it could have been anywhere. It doesn't have to be a Greenwich. Because in the old days, different pl places had different times. So, for instance, there could be a five minutes time difference between Bristol and London. Now, in the old days, that didn't matter. But as communication and transportation got better and better, people started realising they had to reset their watches when they went to a different town, which seemed ridiculous. So, what people across the world came together and said what they want is sort of a universal time. So as you go across the world, you'll have a different time, but you need a baseline to measure it from. So they debated where they should put the baseline. And after a, a long, protracted uh, conversation and a vote, they decided to put it here in Greenwich. Well, so this is a hugely important little line. <laughs> so and you're I'm, walking along yeah, it. Yeah, look, I'm standing on this, which means I will be the first person. If you're standing on that line, you'll be the first person to see the new day. <laughs> we'll return to the observatory later, as I want to find out more about the science behind the episodes of Doctor Who. On set, the cast and crew get ready to shoot what could be the beginning of a beautiful relationship. And action. So what's the plan tonight? Pizza booze telly? Yeah, pizza booze telly. What is he doing up there? You put the advert up yet? Yeah, did it today. Paper shop window. One furnished room available immediately. Shared kitchen, bathroom with 27-year-old male, non-smoker, £400 PCM per calendar kind of month. Uh, suit young professional. Pretty much any guy who's single who has a really, really close female friend who he always says, we're just friends, 
The truth is, he's probably in love with her, and that's no different than with Craig. That's your mission in life, Craig. Find me a man. Yeah, otherwise you have to settle for me. You have to settle for me first. I think it's a situation everyone's been in at some point. I'm sorry, but I really should go. Do you mind if I go? Okay. Yeah, no, just go. No, go on, seriously, you should go. Of course not, go. Oh, cos I could stay. Oh, I mean, I've got plans. <laughs> just pizza. <laughs> OK, right, I'm going. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, I'll see you soon. It's really hard for Craig to declare his love for Sophie because I think he knows that once he does, it's out there and it will change their friendship forever. I love you. I do. Oh, just... Hey, I don't know if you knew... Oh. When you're in that situation, it's quite galling. Um, when you're looking at it from the outside, it's quite funny. I love you. Well, that's good, cos I'm your new lodger. Gareth, a number of years ago, wrote uh, a comic strip for Doctor Who magazine. What The Lodger was originally was a comic strip in the Two magazine. I actually emailed Ross and said, oh, that's, that's so an episode, isn't it? That would just be so brilliant. You know, it's, it's funny, it's charming, it's heartwarming. It, it featured David Tennant's doctor having to stay with Mickey Smith um, for a week while Rose was trapped somewhere in the TARDIS. And it was about, you know, the sort of domestic arrangements. But it was just too late because Mickey had left the show and it was, it was, not, it was no longer possible. I was just fascinated by that idea of the Doctor having to live a normal life. I think the interesting thing was to actually see him doing it. And it makes it quite a different episode, but also quite a fun one, I think. Relishing the opportunity to impress as only a human can and ensure that the Doctor doesn't end up with egg on his face, it's into the kitchen for the new Master Chef. You've got everything I need. Foie omelette, fine herbs, pour deux. So, who's a girl on the fridge? Oh, my friend, Sophie. Girlfriend? Friend is a girl. There's nothing going on. Oh, that's completely normal. Works for me. Yeah, we met about a year ago at work at the call centre. Oh, really? A communications exchange? How interesting. That could be handy. Craig is still seduced by him. He's seduced by the talk, he's seduced by his enthusiasm, and then on top of that, he cooks this amazing omelette. Yeah, the firm's going down, though. Boss is using a totally rubbish business model. I know what they should do. I've got a plan all worked out, but I'm just a phone drone. I can't go running in saying I know best. The whole idea was that the Doctor should be quite messy. He shouldn't be the most perfect sort of cook, cos he obviously doesn't do it very often. Matt won Junior MasterChef when he was nine, but he's sort of not said anything about it, but he, um, he won Junior MasterChef, so uh, he's a pretty good, pretty good cook. Why am I telling you this? I don't even know you. Well, I've got one of those faces. People never stop blurting out their plans while I'm around. Like, where's your stuff? Oh, don't worry. It'll materialise. <laughs> we, we, we can call a pizza. <laughs> I think he's going to go on the next Celebrity MasterChef, he said. He really loves it and he, he sort of wants to do as many of those sort of celebrity reality shows as he can, really. That's what he was saying to me, anyway. <laughs> James Corden is very good at spreading rumours, so I would take it with a pinch of salt. But being human doesn't come that naturally to a Time Lord. Action. All I've got to do is pass as an ordinary human being. Simple. What could possibly go wrong? That's how we greet each other nowadays, isn't it? Doctor, how long are you going to be in there? Oh, oh. Oopsie. Oh, dear. Oh, come on, Amy, I'm a normal bloke. Tell me what normal blokes do. They watch telly, they play football, they go down the pub. I could do those things, I don't, but I could. Oh, oh. It is vital that this man upstairs doesn't realise who and what I am. So no sonic in. No advanced technology. I can only use this because we're on scramble. To so anyone else hearing this conversation, we're talking absolute gibberish. Practical eruption in chicken. They got Lombardi spiral. What are you doing here? It's never worked in an office, never worked in anywhere. If that's your attitude, Mr Lang, I suggest you take your custom elsewhere. I can't go out and say, hey, guys, this is my new flatmate, he's called the Doctor. Why not? Because it's weird. Hello, I'm Craig's new flatmate. I'm called the Doctor. <laughs> All right, Doctor. I mean, I always think when people say the Doctor's eccentric, I think, no. From him looking out, he's behaving completely normally. And, and to us that know all about him if we follow the series, 
we can sort of see that as well. He's not behaving eccentrically, he's behaving exactly as a character would do in that situation. Transferring the comic into a TV script required a few changes. I think it was only on about nine or ten draft that Stephen and Beth and Piers, Catherine the director, was saying, well, hold on, he needs to get into that house. You know, he doesn't have that relationship that Dr. Howard with Mickey in the comic strip. But I only put the advert up today. I didn't put my address. Well, aren't you lucky I came along? More lucky than you know. He can't just turn up and move in. What we actually need is for Craig to really like him. Outdoor, front door, your door. My door, my place, my gaff. Ha <laughs> yes. ha! Me with the key. The television script also went through a few changes along the way with the Doctor bringing Sophie and Craig together while simultaneously defeating the spaceship's deadly autopilot. Initially, Craig got the girl, rescued her, and, that, and they said they loved each other, and the Doctor solved the technological plot. Right, chilled up, let's go. There always was in the story the fact that Sophie and Craig were sort of sat there together in this kind of unrequited love, and what Stephen rather wonderfully did was say, well, hold on, why don't we make both stories resolve together in the same way. I love you too, Craig, you idiot! <laughs> with two time travel machines for Amy to contend with in this week's episode, I want to know if there really is the possibility of life on other planets. And who better to ask than a space scientist? So, here we are in the planetarium in the Royal Observatory. So I'm still with Maggie, who hopefully has all the answers. You and the Doctor travel through space-time, through science fiction. But what I want to do now is I want to take you on a tour of the universe to show you what's really out there. This is planet Earth. This is where we live. Earth is quite amazing, because as we go through our journey, you'll see that Earth is covered in water. Four-fifths of the Earth's surface is water. And about four-fifths of our body is water. So we're very much a product of the planet we live on. Now, what we're doing here is we're zooming into the UK and zooming into Scotland, and at the centre of the screen should be Inverness. <gasps> we're in Inverness! Brilliant, that is excellent. <laughs> and where are we going from Inverness? Right, from Inverness, I think next stop is the moon. <gasps> so I'm going from Inverness to the moon. That's like a dream come true. Now, if you see the moon, it looks quite different from the Earth. Firstly, no water. And also, the moon has no atmosphere. Now, what we've done is we've zoomed into the centre of our solar system, and here's the sun. We've got a sunspot sort of drifting past there. Now, the sun provides us with virtually all the energy we use here on Earth. So the sun is the powerhouse. OK. And it keeps all the other planets orbiting them. And here we have the planets of the inner solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Time is definitely sped up here because it takes Earth a year to go all the way around the sun. Right. And here it's actually taking just a few seconds. So next up, we want to go and visit Mars. My retirement plan is I want to go and retire on Mars. <laughs> Why would you like to retire to Mars? <gasps> well, Mercury and Venus are horrible places, really high temperatures. <laughs> Earth well, I know that. And Mars um, has a temperature of about minus 50, which is a bit nippy, <laughs> but um, I think I could survive there. And also it has water. And so um, uh, we need water to live. Yeah. So that means I could just about live on Mars. Wow. So so life could potentially be on Mars. Yes, and we've been looking for life on Mars, but we haven't found it to date. But we keep on searching. Okay. So now what we're doing is we're zooming out. We've got the sun in the centre, and now it just looks like a very dim star. And we're seeing the, all the planets in our solar system. And um, what we want to do next is we want to go and visit the planet Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. Okay. In fact, you could fit a thousand Earths into Jupiter. So it's pretty massive. Pretty big. But then again, you could fit a thousand Jupiters into the sun. <laughs> so that means you could fit right. a million Earths into the sun. So the sun is pretty huge. So it is, it is completely massive. <laughs> yes. So we've seen the sun, that's our local star. Well, I wanted to go and see our next door neighbour star. That's Proxima Centauri. And as you can see, as we get close to it, you can see it looks just like the sun. And that's what some people don't realise. All the stars we see in the night sky are suns like our sun, which means they could potentially have planets going round them. What we're doing now is we're zooming out to our galaxy, the Milky Way, and you can see that there is a plethora of stars out there. We live just on one of the spiral arms, rather boringly. But it's estimated that in the Milky Way, there are about 150 billion stars. <laughs> it's a bit of a uh, mind-boggling number. What? <laughs> so life on other planets is quite possible. Well, we think it's quite likely because there are so many planets out there, but it might not be life as we know it. <laughs> but what I want to do now is I want to show you what's at the edge of the universe. 
This is um, something called the Hubble Deep Field. And for this, what the Hubble Space Telescope did is it looked at a piece of what we thought was empty space for about six days. So a really long exposure. And then we got the data back. And then what we realised is what we thought was empty space wasn't actually empty at all. It actually had all these points of light in it. Now, we looked at these points of light and we thought, OK, there were stars out there. But when we looked at it a lot more closely, we realised that each one of those points of light is another galaxy. Right, so that's just... I mean, that's just even more yes. mind-boggling. So um, from this, we've actually tried to work out how many galaxies are in the whole of the universe. And we've come up with a rather large number. There are approximately, give or take a few, a hundred billion galaxies. I mean, that must just be a, a huge amount that's very difficult to compute. <laughs> yes. Travelling from our star to the next-door neighbour star, Proxima Centauri, travelling at 10.5 miles a second will take 76,000 years. Mm -hmm. So even if there is life out there, the problem is getting out there. Yeah, which is why I wish the TARDIS was real. <laughs> yes, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I want the TARDIS to be real. <laughs> Me too. Life back on Earth is a little more complicated. As a new member of the human race, the Doctor offers Craig and Sophie something you'd expect from any good friend, advice. The Doctor sort of plays Cupid, really, with both of them and finally gets them to realise that actually what's keeping them there and what they like about each other is the fact that they want to be together. Action. Because life can seem pointless, you know, Doctor. Work we can, work we can. And there's six billion people on the planet doing pretty much the same. Six billion people. Watching you two at work, I'm starting to wonder where they all come from. What? What do you mean by that? So, the call centre, that's no good then. What do you really want to do? Part of the Doctor's behaviour in the scene where he inspires Sophie to go away is to inspire her to realise why she's not going. Watching Sophie and Craig, you know, he can see a mile off they ought to be together. He, he says about the keys. Those are your keys. You must have left them last time you came here. Yeah, but I... How do you know these are my keys? I've been holding them. I've got another set. You've got two sets of keys to someone else's house. Yeah? I see. She is sort of waiting for Craig to make the first move and he actually seems incapable of doing it. You must like it here too. <laughs> He's been around the human race for a very long time, you know. To him, this is like monkeys mating. What do you really want to do? Don't laugh. I only ever told Craig about it. Mm? I want to work looking after animals. Maybe abroad. I saw this orangutan sanctuary on telly. Well, what's stopping you? She can't. You need loads of qualifications. To... Yeah, true. They're quite happy where they are. They've got no desire to go. Craig got offered a job in London. Better money. Didn't take it. What's wrong with staying here? I can't see the point of London. I think they're just both so terrified, as people are, of, of change and, you know, if you love someone, what if they don't love you back? All that stuff. Well, perhaps that's you, then. You'll just have to stay here, secure and just a little bit miserable till the day you drop. The Doctor knows. Hopefully that's a prod to her to get something going. Perhaps. In the whole wide universe, a call centre is about where you should be. Why are you saying that? That's horrible. Is it true? Of course it's not true. I'm not staying in a call centre all my life. I can do anything I want. Oh! <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my God, did you see what he just did? No, sorry, what's happening? Are you going to live with monkeys now? It's a big old world, Sophie. Work out what's really keeping you here, eh? I can't. Time travel is an integral part of Doctor Who, and I want to find out how the Doctor and Amy managed to do this. Maggie, do we think that time travel is actually possible? Most scientists would say yes, they think it is. I'll, like, I'll try and explain why. Now, this is sort of baby's rattle. This represents 3D space. So as a scientist, I'll say sort of X, Y and Z, but it's just, you and me, it's sort of you know, up and down, left and right, to and fro. Okay. So that's 3D space. But what I want to talk about is space-time. So take 3D space and then have another fourth dimension, which is time. OK. Now, Einstein sort of came up with this idea of space-time. And so what we can do is we can take the 3D of um, space and time as well and squish them all together into a, a coordinate system. And so this sheet now represents space-time. Now, let's say you want to get from A to B, and A is um, our local star, the sun, okay. and B is our next-door neighbour's star. OK, so we want to get to our sun to the next sun. Yes. Usually in conventional methods, you'd have to sort of take the long route, so you'd have to go from A to B and go sort of in a straight line, and that'd be the quickest way you could get there. But if we can actually distort space-time, which is, I think, what you and the Doctor do, you take A and B and put them together 
and then form something like a wormhole to travel in between them. Okay. Now you can see that your wormhole will be a much, much quicker way of getting there than the conventional route from A to B. That's a very handy shortcut. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, we talk about wormholes there. Yeah. And uh, we believe that wormholes exist because the mathematics indicates that wormholes might exist, but we haven't found them yet. So, time travel is actually possible. Yeah, and now th there's one caveat on that. If you travel backwards in time, you start to create paradoxes, and paradoxes are nasty. There's this thing called the grandfather paradox. And this um, results is if you go back in time and shoot your granddad. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> now, hypothetically, of course. Yes. <laughs> so you go back and kill your granddad, then yeah. you'd cease to exist. So, in which case, who's gone back and shot your granddad? Right, yeah. Because of these paradoxes, these things that don't quite make sense, don't quite add up, we don't believe you can travel backwards in time. Okay. We think you can travel forward in time, but we don't think you can travel backwards in time. Wow, that's mind boggling. <laughs> yes. Travelling through time isn't the only thing the Doctor seems to be good at. It may come as a surprise, but he's also got a nifty right foot. Let's just shoot some goals now. Let's just shoot match, scoring some goals. The football match was very easy to do, in fact. It didn't need a lot of choreography, simply because Matt Smith's so brilliant at football. Yeah. It could be a volley. Well, no, I'll do a... Comes in on the chair, so I can... Doom, doom. Yeah. Bang. Yeah. Craig could cross one in and I can finish with my left foot. Header would be great. <laughs> I just want to tell James, just sort of, you know, trying to get him waiting to play, but you never get the ball because no, you've just stolen the game. I'm familiar so I'm... with that feeling. <laughs> and I, so I need James's POV of, of the dog scoring as well. So I'll do it, I, I mean, whichever Simon wants to do first, but I obviously need to see his point of view of Matt just taking over the game, basically. Is that too. A... So it One. depends which we do. But let's do the set piece we've set up now. So let's do some goal scoring, yeah? You can't escape the fact that he's really good at football. Like, I think he used to play for Leicester. This looks like it's real, but it's actually all CG. I apologise if I hit anyone. He, he can't kick a ball to save his life, so... It's like, this is... It looks real. This is all green screen. The ball isn't even there. They've just put it in with a computer, so it looks like he's chesting it, kneeling it and volleying it. So even then the tapping for the dock? Yeah. Fine. But, there's not even a ball. So further around that way, this is all CGI. Left as well, left, our guy. He's never even seen a ball in his life. When we told him it was football, he's like, Come in and mark Matt a little bit. Sure, we've so all read the story. He's like, Oh, I played less than school balls. He didn't. Just to come right back and mark him. Sure that, it's, all, it's all just special effects, yep. stunts. So Watch this now. Yeah. Okay, stand by for a take. Do the computer generated ball. He's got some real skills, and he was scouted as a kid, you know, so he's so he's brilliant. He's really, really good. Hey, James is a right laugh, and um, I was just playing football all day. I've, I felt very lucky, really. Chest, and I'll put it higher. Yeah, you, ready? Yeah, you hey, chest it and put it higher. <laughs> to play football as the doctor who scores all the goals and is the quickest and the best. OK, for a take, please. Sort of like uh, all the dreams coming true at once, in a way, I suppose. <laughs> and welcome to a very special edition of Football Focus. The King's Arms broke new ground this week and made history with their signing of the first football time lord. Yes, it's the Doctor. Great excitement here at Victoria Park. The King's Arms unveiling their new stellar signing. It's the Doctor. Hang on to your boots. This could be out of this world. Well, today the Doctor comes and plays for the King's Arms with uh, his flatmate, Craig. And what a pairing the King's Arms boast now, with Craig Owens in great form. The Doctor and Owens, numbers 11 and 7, a pairing made in heaven. 
but the planet hopping time traveler better beware. He faces a formidable foe today. It's the rising sun, and the doctor happy to muck in for this one. What a game in store! It's not only his debut for the King's Arms, it's. well, his debut. With the Doctor making his debut appearance, it's promised to be the pub league match to rival all pub league matches, the King's Arms against the Rising Sun. We can join Steve Wilson pitch side at Victoria Park in Cardiff for highlights of the game that's been brewing for a while now. Attendance for this match, 46, cast and crew. And this is how they line up. The King's Arms has chosen Craig Owens in his regular spot. This is what we've all been waiting for, though. The Doctor making his debut for the team and a lot resting on his performance today. And the Rising Sun looking strong with a formation we've seen them use before. And it's Craig Owens passing to the Doctor. Oh, nice footwork. Impressive start from the gangling Gallifreyan. He's still going. Look at this. Oh, what a goal by the Doctor. It's 1-0 to the King's Arms. And he's off again. Magnificent footwork. Oh, and he's made it too. He's in magnificent form today. Nice ball in by the Doctor. The Rising Sun have barely had a kick yet. Great excitement on the touchline. Oh, what timing by the Doctor. But what else would you expect? It's 3-0. Fantastic play by Owens. Oh, what a turn for a big man. Unlucky. Oh, and the Doctor with a follow-up to make it four. Great chest tap by the Doctor, and that's five. It's six. Extraordinary. King's arm seven. It's a free kick. Craig Owens is ready to dispatch this in the back of the Rising Sun net. Assessing his angles, oh, but the Doctor arrives, and it's eight! <laughs> and Owens isn't happy. The Doctor stole his glory, and he's hit eight. What a performance, and what a game. Owens doesn't look best pleased. The King's Arms have a new hero. It's the Doctor. And back to you, Dan, and the Football Focus Studio. Right, well, let's get some reaction to that. Um, Lee and Laura have joined us in the studio. What do we think? Well, an incisive pass there from Craig Owens to the Doctor. Uh, he found himself on Mark, didn't he, Laura? Nice dummy. Look Defensive, not particularly good. But look at how much time he's got. Great skill, mind. Loves a step over. Just beat the 14 on his way through to the goal. Both what feet. What a finish as well. Both feet. A little Both feet. think of a finish. Came from nowhere. Super, super strike. That's, that's the end of the rising sun, that. <laughs> and in terms of the free kick, we, we thought the big lad was going to take it. That was a dodgy free kick, by the way. Yeah, that was a great free decision. Free and watch this here now, Dan. Absolutely brilliant. Look at that. Not wow. a chance of goalkeeper. Not a chance. Not so sure. I think he should have saved that. Training Four ground move, that? Training ground? Training ground move, definitely. And now we can hand back to uh, Doctor Who Confidential for some post-match interviews. Best days filming ever on Doctor Who today. <laughs> Not because of JC, but because um, we're playing football. Action! Come on, come on! Yes! 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 Guys, next thing we're going to do is free kick, please. It's been a while since I've played, but to play today was just bliss. Is it about down? Yeah. yeah. Step back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he just comes in and takes it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the filming sections were very choreographed, so if it looks like I'm rubbish, that's why. It's not me, it's the... There were a few moments I thought, oh, thank God, I've got to be rubbish. I really scuffed the ball and stuff, and I was like, just, you know, really in character. <laughs> Tusta creams, football. This is what, ah, oh, shock two, isn't it, Kieran? Best day ever. I love this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
It's full time on the pitch, but there's another important time-related question I need an answer to. Um, in this episode, um, the Doctor's facing something called time loops. Right. Now, do we think those can exist? Time loops are probably possible. Because, again, if you take your sort of sheet of space-time, because if you actually have space-time and you actually put a fold in it, and when you have a crease in space-time, what it's doing is it's bringing two bits of space-time that shouldn't be together together. Mm -hmm. So each time you go across this, you actually have a little jump in space and time. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I think in this episode, it's a jump in time. People are dying up there! People are dying! People are dying! People are dying! People are dying! Because these two bits of uh, space-time aren't meant to be linked, and yet somehow they have been linked. It doesn't make sense. No. So that's kind of what would happen physically. So okay. each time you go through, you'll have that strange glitch. And so you set up these loops. Yeah. Um, they're like glitches, but they're sort of loops that don't add up. And what do we think will actually happen during that? Well, so um, it'll just have discontinuities. Things won't make uh, make sense. So there is science behind the script. <laughs> you sound surprised. <laughs> <laughs> the time loop in the football scene. Ah! Hey! What we wanted was for the Doctor to be able to be in the scene, patently not affected by the time loop. And the Doctor is free of all that and can observe it, because he's realised that whenever there's a time loop on Earth, it affects Amy and the TARDIS. And we did this with a green screen and put the doctor in and then he had to act the scene as though everybody was in it. Annihilate them, no, no violence. Do you understand me? Not while I'm around, not today, not ever. We shot the scene without the doctor in it, but with all the football team in it, all acting as though the doctor was there. Then the visual effects team take over and they managed to marry the two and make it so that there's all the footballers repeat exactly what they do the whole time, but Matt in the middle can act normally. Cut. Sophie. You guys all right? Yeah, it's the camera right. It's <laughs> <laughs> the camera right. Yeah, yeah, Good yeah, job yeah. you put that poly on it. A time loop in the Doctor's world is a sign of sinister goings on in the flat above. Craig goes into a time loop again, and that's when the Doctor realises that something is happening, something very dangerous is happening upstairs. Action! There's this! Guitar. A statement on modern society. Ooh! Ain't modern society awful? <clears throat> Me and you, it's not going to work out. You've only been here three days. It'll be the three weirdest days of my life. Three days will get a lot weirder if I go. The Doctor is free of the time loop. Time travel. It can happen sometimes. When it happens, everyone is compelled to repeat whatever action they're doing or whatever they're saying. People are dying up there! People are dying! People are dying! People are dying up there! People are dying up there! People are dying! Amy. Hey, they're being killed! It's happening again right now. Someone's up there. Oh, my God. I love that kind of thing, you know, where time is an unpleasant, dark force. It's not just a passive thing that you move through. I love all that. Action! Someone's up there. Oh, my And there is definitely no time to lose, as the alien upstairs has one very important victim. Come on, take someone's side! <laughs> Sophie. Sophie! If Sophie is going, it's Sophie! Wait, 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 Craig, wait! I've got the plans. You cannot be upstairs. It's a one-story building. There is no upstairs. What? Now I know a little bit about the science behind the science fiction, it's time to see if I can do a little time travelling of my own. We have something else for you. <laughs> really? Because <laughs> what I'm going to do is introduce you uh, to the um, public astronomer here at the observatory, uh, Dr. Merrick Kakula, and he has a very nice surprise for you. Then let us go. Perfect. Come on. To travel back in time, Merrick is going to show me a star that has quite a relevance to Doctor Who. So here we are, and what we're going to see is this star up here. It's in the constellation of Ursa Major, the Great Bear. And the other thing we can do here, as well as having no clouds, is actually show you the shape of the constellation. So that's what cool. we're bringing up now. And you can see the lines of the constellation, and now the Great Bear himself. Oh. And the star that we're interested in is right at the end of the bear's front paw. Um, and it's the top of those two stars just on the tip of his claws. And it's yeah. called Iota Ursae Majoris, or Talitha. And that star is 47 light years away, which means the light that we're seeing from it now has been travelling towards us for 47 years. 47 years. That's right. And that's quite a special number 
because it means that the light that we're seeing set out in 1963. <gasps> And that's a special year for Doctor Who, isn't it? It is indeed, yes. the year that Doctor Who began. That's right. So if there are aliens living on planets around that star, mm. they would just be able to pick up the first television transmissions <laughs> of Doctor Who if they're tuning their receivers towards us at the moment. Yeah, so they'll tune be watching in, guys. the first episode. <laughs> Brilliant. So we are looking at 1963. You are actually looking at 1963. So although we can't actually take you through time physically, we can actually show you the past um, the machine we do it with is not the TARDIS, obviously it's a telescope mm. because the further you look into space, the further you're looking back into time. That is incredible and mind-blowing. We're looking back in time. Yeah, that's right, looking right back in time. And of course, there are many, many different stars at many different distances. So mm. as you choose a different star, you're looking at a different period of history. Mm. So there are stars up there where the light set out 22 years ago when you were being born. Wow. Oh my goodness. So in a sense, it's like a bit of a birthday star for you. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> so number ones, please. The realisation of what's upstairs comes as a surprise to the Doctor and Craig. There's a great deal of space and a definite lack of time. We're filming, um, I guess, sort of the climax of the episode where the Doctor and Craig, my character, realise that this spaceship, which is sort of like another TARDIS, has been... Uh, on top of Craig's flat the whole time. Action! What? What? The crash spaceship was a massive set, and in fact, we decided to make it even bigger, largely because it's, in principle, very similar to a TARDIS, in that it's uh, larger on the inside than on the outside. Action! What? What? Oh, of course. It was just really exciting, and it was like an eight-page scene. That day was a very, very busy day because there were eight pages of dialogue and there were special effects and there were um, pyrotechnics with smoke and sparks, and we just had to really get our heads down and get going. The time engine isn't in the flat. The time engine is the flat. Someone's attempt to build a TARDIS. When you come onto a show like this, you want those moments where you're in a big spaceship. There's always been an upstairs. How's that think about it? Yes! You've got to run around and something's at stake. Ah! Sophie! Sophie! It's controlling her, it's willing her to touch the activator! No, it's not gonna have her! Oh. Oh. Why is it letting her go? The doctor's realised now that it's zapping people and trying to get them to try and be the pilot. Because we were on this raised platform in the middle of the set and the cameras were, were around the outside, it almost becomes like you're doing a play. You sort of forget that you're filming, really. Right, stop! Crash ship, let's see. Hello, I'm Captain Troy Hansen of International Rescue. Please state the nature of your emergency. The ship has crashed, the crew are dead, a pilot is required. And you're the emergency crash program, a hologram. We've been luring people up here to try them out. You will help me, you will help me, you will help me. Matt was brilliant, like he was doing this whole thing where his body was lurching around. <laughs> Fly it, the whole solar system would burst. I wait too much for this ship, my hand touches my panel. The planet doesn't blow, the whole solar system goes up! So he's trying not to touch it, so he manages to get Craig to touch it instead. Do you want to move? No! Finally gets Craig to admit, just taking the whole episode, that he loves Sophie. Why don't you want to leave? Oh, Sophie! I, I, I could only leave Sophie, I can't leave Sophie, I love Sophie! Sophie then realises that she loves him. I love you too, Greg, you idiot! They both put their hands on the console of the spaceship and the whole thing blows up. <laughs> Honestly, do you mean that? Of course I mean it, do you mean it? I've always meant to. Seriously, though, do you mean it? Yes. Oh, no, not now, not again, Craig. The planet's about to burn. For God's sake, kiss the girl! Kiss the girl! <laughs> Doctor? You've done it. <laughs> You've done it! Big yes! Help, help me, help me, help me, help me! Help me, help, help, me, help, help, help me, help me, help me! Big no. Emergency shutdown, it's imploding, everybody out! Go, 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 now! Out, out, out! It was a good scene to do, because it took all day. It felt very real, the emotions of it and stuff. I really enjoyed it.
whole top floor just vanished. There's one more treat in store for me at the observatory, as Marek lets me take a look at the real sky at night with something truly out of this world. So, Maggie promised you a surprise, and here it is. It's the biggest refracting telescope in the United Kingdom. How big is it? Well, with telescopes, the important thing is the size of the lens. And this one here has a lens which is 28 inches across, which is still about as big as you can make them. So even though this is 120 almost years old, it really was the Hubble Space Telescope of its day. Wow, and um, so the bigger the lens, the more we can see. That's right. The bigger the lens, the more light you can get through and the fainter the objects you can see, so the further out you can see into space. And that's great for doing astronomy where you want to explore as far out into the universe as you can possibly go. So let's get the dome open and then we can have a look at the sky. Let's go. Now we can see the sky, so let's move the telescope down. With the telescope in place, I'm about to get the chance to see something totally amazing. I have no idea what it is, but I'm very excited. Take a look. Okay. See what you think. What is it? <gasps> oh my goodness. That's real. I'm actually looking at Saturn right now. I can see, I can, so it's really clear. I can see it, it's sort of like a yellow ball with these rings going around it. <laughs> I can't believe it, I really can't. It's like, I don't know, it's just really hard to compute that that's actually out there right now. It's kind of like a, a yellowy colour. And uh, how many moons does Saturn have? It has at least 60 moons. And then, of course, it has the rings, which are made of billions of tiny, tiny icy moons all orbiting around the planet. They're made of billions of, of bits of ice, up to the size of, probably about the size of a car, down to the size of a tiny pebble. And they're all independently orbiting around Saturn, like billions of tiny moons. I can't, I'm just gonna It's a pretty incredible sight. It really is. I mean, it just, wow. That is so incredible. And I can see the two moons as well. Okay, so I've got one last thing to show you. Behind me, um, you can see the meridian line in the form of a laser. Now, I've been told on a good night, it can stretch for up to 70 kilometers and it runs right through London and into Essex. So, that brings me to the end of our visit to the observatory and I think it's fair to say that my brain is ready to explode. It's completely mind-blowing. You know, probability suggests that there could be life on other planets and potentially in the future, time travel could actually be possible. Um, I find it so fascinating. I guess I've got an invested interest in it because I've been working on Doctor Who. And, but this visit has, has given me a tiny glimpse into the life of Amy Pond. Thanks for joining me. Everybody's story I